Uh, welcome back, everyone, to another Learning Tech Talks, where we are living at the intersection of business, technology, and the human experience. Today, I'm looking forward to sitting down with Jeremy Berman from Dream See Do, and we're going to be talking about a lot of things, which, based on the backstage conversation, there's going to be no shortage of fun and energy in the conversation. Absolutely. So I'm looking forward to it. But we're going to be talking about what it means to do full cycle talent development and what that looks like and how we can do that digitally in a way that preserves the human experience in meaningful ways and that it doesn't have to be a second grade experience. So I'm looking forward to it. Jeremy, I know I've been waiting. It's always fun when I go live on these because guests have been waiting a long time to be on. And so when I actually get the chance to do the live stream, it's super fun. So thanks so much for joining me. Right on. Great to be here, man. Yeah, I'm excited as well. I've been looking forward to this and I think we're gonna have a lot of fun and great things to oh. chat about. No, I, I never have any doubts about that. My energy yeah. level on these is always uh, roof window blowing. Um, awesome. So for those who may not know who you are, though, a little bit, because I'm always curious, too, in the founder story of backstory into, was this a childhood dream of yours that someday you would create a ed tech platform for developing talent? What, what is your backstory? Yeah, not exactly, but... It's not exactly. Yeah, okay. I mean, yeah, it's in the dream is in the name, but um, I mean, I think it's one of those things where you don't realize as you're moving along in your life that maybe it, it was meant to be, right? You know, because okay. I, I when I started dream, so it wasn't like blatant. You had a a vision board as a child, and a no. tech company was on it. But as you look back and reflect on some things, you see some parallels. Oh yeah, and some some lines of sort of a uh, trajectory being formed. My mom reminded me um, when I started Dream to Do that I was like a peer counselor in high school and all these things that you don't realize until really? you, the pieces okay. come together. Yeah, I mean, I was a camp counselor. I taught swimming lessons. Um, I was a lifeguard. I did all these different things where I was really- So lifetime talent developer. I think so. I mean, like mentorship, as a mentor, at, you know, I loved being a mentee. I've always sought out mentorship from various leaders. And I think the one thread, man, that is common is I've always had this very deep entrepreneurial spirit and vision. And so I think that had, you know, as I grew up, I, you know, I was doing like hand car washes with my friends one summer and I was always working, having odd jobs to like make a buck and understand what it was like. And I think that was a great value system that my parents instilled in me that was important. And I always had a propensity for it, but I was, a mu I mean, you can see with my guitar, I was a music producer for years. And, you know, um, I think that was a dream of mine. And, and honestly, maybe that was more of a dream was to become like either. Performing Wait, so I, okay. So now yeah. I got it. We got to unpack this. <laughs> I told you, I because coach mentored you were this developer of talent had this entrepreneurial spirit how did the music producer squeak in there or was that i i'm not even going to try and fill in the blanks yeah i mean it was i've been a musician my whole life i think my mom said i was okay. like matching pitch at like two weeks old, like or it's cooing notes at like two weeks old and literally matching pitch at really two years, two years old yeah i was very early i had perfect pitch i think until i was eight um, all kinds of crazy, interesting stories about singing. Um, had a, had a group in high school. I can't believe we're talking about this, but um, an acapella group that was kind of <laughs> like it'll date me a little bit, but kind of like voice to men. We had like a development deal offer. They wanted us to what? Or yeah, we they want us to quit high school to like do this deal, and we're like, uh, like I don't. It's not really gonna happen. We're like all going into college. We're like second semester seniors, so we kind of like cried it out and said we're not doing this, but. We had a very musical and talented high school. In fact, like the valedictorian ended up being like the head writer of like and creator of major TV shows like um, Brooklyn Nine-Nine and, um, you okay. know, uh, stuff like that. So there's just a lot of talent there and a lot of musical okay. talent. So it was just, it was something that was in the water in our town. I think for my sister's years, <laughs> a few years older than mine. In a good way. Usually and when people really, say there was something in the water, it's not always a, a good thing. No, so no, this was, was a good no, one. This was potable. This was musical talent that magically <laughs> sprinkled its way yeah, into man. the water treatment plant. I like it. Yeah, I had a magical musical experience in high school <laughs> um, and it was really profound and really influenced me. And I, when we actually start, when we, I'll get to a little bit of the Dream CD story, but when we started Dream CD, we would tell I would tell kids about that because it was my dream. You know, really music was my dream. We, we kind of turned down that, you know, it's a longer story, but like to say one time, like we turned down that, that, that offer in high school. And, and there was another time in my twenties where, you know, there was an opportunity to become a perform, performing artist, but I ended up becoming a music producer instead. And what's so interesting is my career, like you have these meandering paths, you know, often as I worked in music, um, I loved it, but then, you know, I realized that like, it really wasn't making me happy and I really wanted to make an impact. And um, there's a lot that surrounds it, but uh, 
you know, that's kind of, that's ultimately what led me to starting my, my company. Um, In many ways is part of the talent development journey. I think for everybody, you know, you, and the, the number of people I've talked to as a leader of this, but then just also in my professional intersection of I'm rap crazy curious about people's journeys. Yeah. Common theme is that everybody's journey is really different, but it is this, there's no clear map of, okay, this is exactly how it's going to go for people. And honestly, sometimes the people that have that path end up sometimes where you described where maybe they followed the map and they went, some people do. Yeah. This map didn't really kind of get me <laughs> what I thought I was going to get. And it leads to a later in life shift of, well, now how do I take these skills and apply it in different ways? Totally. And I think it's a great segue. I'll, I'll, I'll sort of share how like the first little prototype we had for our product actually for GMC do was around just yeah, that. You're a music producer and then sh sh change gears. Yeah. And, and there, and it's around pathing actually. And I'll, I'll give you, a, I mean, so basically just to give you a sense of what, why this is important and why I care about this is I was also sort of like this like armchair psychologist and I studied psychology at WashU and St. Louis okay. in college. And so I, there's that other theme too, of just like, a deep desire to like help people and to unlock yeah. human potential to be there for people to nurture them, which shows up in how we create our team and how we support them, how we support our clients, how we have a lot of, um, you know, customer intimacy and all that we do, uh, with, with our, with our company. But that's really along with sort of that mentorship side of things. And just that theme throughout my life was, has always been really important to me, man. It's, 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 it's really a critical piece that I think led to, I, again, you can look back and see how all the pieces came together. But at the time I was like, you know, after I had my degree in psychology and I, I did double minor in economics and business um, at the old business okay. school. Okay. At Washington. So, so there, yeah. so yeah, I did. So, but you, but it didn't really make sense. My, I had an internship in music actually, and I hated it. <laughs> then I did marketing at Stanley Kaplan right out of college and then eventually got into music production in Atlanta and then moved to New York. Um, to do that and, and pursue it. And I, I did really well, like, you know, by standards, but you know, and it was yeah. fun in my yeah, 20s, by American just standards of this yeah. is what good looks yeah. like. It's like, yeah, okay. Yeah, on but paper, it, it looked fine, but it wasn't, it wasn't fulfilling. Yeah, turning your I, crank. I was I like guess. a nexus of three like industries in advertising, film and music. Each of them of themselves are beautiful from an artistic standpoint, but there's a little bit of ego in each of them. So can you imagine working at the nexus of all three of those? <laughs> like how much, okay. you know, how intense that yeah. would be. And so I was just, I could handle it because I have that kind of personality to be able to kind of, you know, brush things off and deal with it. But I was like, what? At some point I was just like, this is crushing my love of music, right? And it really yeah. did, man. And that, and that's yeah, it that no journey was a you... passion. It was no. like, well, now this is just a job. Like, I, and I can see it squelching it. So then how does that then transform to, where does the idea of, hey, you know what we should do? We should create a talent development platform. Cause that's a pretty big shift. It is. And, and, and there's a couple of pieces in between. I mean, I'll just quickly say like, so I did a music production thing. I was kind of figuring things out. I did a lot of consulting. I was basically okay. building companies for other people. I helping them okay. grow and make money in music and other ways. And I, I really, in re retrospect, I was sort of cutting my teeth in a safe way, but I, I yeah. also have a bit of a yeah, low risk. You didn't have to go yes. in on it and you're helping other people, but you're learning along the way, yeah. which is again, yes. And I've always had vision and right. Yes, exactly. Sorry. Yeah. And so I was, I was doing that. Um, obviously there's no lack of energy between you and I, man. Um, so, so I was, I was doing that, but I, but I, I also was like, you know what, not in an egotistical way, but like, I just have vision and like, I want to express that. So it got to a point where I needed to do my own thing. I ended up starting a business, I'll a quick story um, called my daily thread. It was early days of Groupon, man. And like, we, we actually researched yeah. interesting business ideas. My co-founder and I, who's one of my best friends from growing up. And we found out about Groupon, they were like eight employees or something. And we're like, this is really interesting. This will work well. I worked in music, he worked in fashion. We're like, these are lifestyle businesses. We can sell lifestyle companies, but create a different model. And we did. And instead of like crushing companies like Group Groupon, because they had way too many deals and they literally helped close, they, not helped, they closed businesses, man. It wasn't good. We would tell oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, because it, it just wasn't any, it was completely they, No, it was all right volume. Up. Yes, it was all volume. And what we did instead was, and the tipping point became a gimmick, dude, in like three months. We even reached okay. out to them cold and said, hey, do you want to work together? They sent us a contract. They, they, they saw what we were up to. And they loved it. 
and they wanted to hire us on us like employee eight and nine and we didn't do it and then i'm like the joke is like we like my wife and i would like cry in a glass of wine like oh, god like, <laughs> millions from that but like it's not about the money but i mean i, I made the right decision it just did, it didn't feel right we wanted to it's do like that person thing. that turned down apple stock when yeah, like I mean, it was in the garage though. you're like ah oh, man but i wouldn't be here talking to you leading dream studio if i'd done that Right. And can you imagine a world where you weren't spending today talking to me? No, that, it would that have, in just of that itself alone, would just right. be a tragedy. <laughs> it would be a tra it would be absolutely tragic. <laughs> right. That's the main thing that we got to remember. So yeah, man. So I, I started the company. We would like tell a, you know, again, the supportive nurturing thread, we would tell a, you know, I, and I, I was, I've been a chief creative officer and like a creative director for years as well. So I always had this, I'd be writing blogs or doing overseeing photography or doing the photography. So I've been involved in those creative things my whole life, even with my wedding, man, like I, I see, I'm very particular too. People joke about that. But, um, I saw like the font was- I noticed pixel. backstage when you were setting up your, your like background. Yeah, I was getting things all set up, exactly. <laughs> so I noticed that the, 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 the font was a pixel off and I called them and my wife was like, dude, you're nuts. But like I had them move it. So I have that, both that feel for like being the architect, yeah. but also the details that Attention zooming in and detail. zooming out. Yeah, man. So we would like tell a cool, compelling story about like a guy who like, or a woman that ran like a salon or a restaurant and their their charity that they did or something cool they were doing in the community to support and nurture people around them. And guess what? We would be able to sell clients that Groupon couldn't because we were supporting these businesses. And guess what else happened? The businesses grew. And so we had an interesting learning experience because we sold that company and like all this crazy stuff happened where we didn't get the back end deal because then they sold. So we hit our heads in every way possible, man. I think that's the, the, sure. the nut of it is like, we did, I did this first entrepreneurial journey. Listen, as an entrepreneur, you, you, and I was a little late in the game. I was in my like late twenties, early thirties. Um, but yeah. I'm a late bloomer and you know, which is cool. And I, I dig that. I, I needed to find that maturity in my own way and that wisdom. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that, but like we hit our head in every way possible. And I, and you either take those learnings into your next thing or you just don't. Yeah. And we did. And so like all the things that I did wrong, I'm very, it's very prescient, man. When things come up, I'm like, oh, wow, I don't want to do it like I did that thing last time. Yeah. And this no, failure business. is life's greatest teacher. It oh, really man. is. But again, it's a choice you make on Talent whether you're going to take those failures and go, <laughs> am I going to do something with it? Yes. Or am I going to smash my head into the next wall the exact same way? Because I'm convinced that, well, maybe that wall just was the wrong wall to smash my head into right and it's a messy process and this is all that it's it is them it's thematic because like i i think another theme of why this is so important to me is like i've always been someone that has that's worked on my own self-awareness and my myself like whether it's through yoga yeah. meditation therapy like all of it i'm constantly trying to evolve like who i am as a person to be a better father to be a better husband to be a better friend a better a better leader and that is so critically important. And I'll, I'll, I'll quickly get to the story about how I met my co-founder because it was vitally important to him. So to kind of tail off of the other business, we ended up, I get, got out of the business. I'm like, what am I going to do now? And I was consulting for a while and it was, that's a whole other thing, but I, I won't go into all that detail. Basically, my wife sent me this email about, um, no, sorry, she, let me backtrack. She told me about, she, she, she does um, foundation work. Um, so she would give money to nonprofits okay. basically. And she was doing these big yep. foundations in New York City when we were living there for a while. And she told me about this, um, uh, the, the Queens Library System she was giving some funding to. And she's like, Jeremy, it's not just a bunch of dusty old books anymore. Like they have great programming and they have technology. You'd love it. Like just meet the CEO. And she, she made that connection, which was great. And okay. he and I hit it off. Long story short, I do like a little less than a year consulting with them to like reimagine their digital products created this beautiful digital product, um, which has its own backstory, but it was really proud of that impacted a lot of people right after storm Sandy. This is around 2012 okay. people that didn't have connection with Wi-Fi, And we created this tablet for all these resources where they, for jobs, for all different kinds of um, backgrounds and they could find things okay. based on who they were, what was most important yeah, to them to really help them grow yes. in their professional journey. In their lives, yeah, it could be professional yeah, journey in or lives. in lives, any kind of learning at that time. It was any kind of learning, but the okay. whole UX was centered around and the, and the thematic thing that I helped the team come up with was, you know, who am I and what, you know, what, and it was what, designed to be off the grid. I mean, it was designed to be. It just was designed to literally yes, and it we it had to be because it was a gift from Google where the the rule was it had to be just like like it had to just work. Only, it couldn't just be work. like oh we got it just has to work. That's it. You couldn't access anything else on the, on the device because they, they donated these devices. It was, it was a, man, it was like a game show. It was a challenge, but we made it. Yeah, work. It no, that super... sounds like the kind of fun, kind of like, okay, how are we going to crack this nut? Yeah. And that, 
yes, and that really from a design standpoint, from a user experience standpoint, that those forcing agents, man, I'll tell you, like I'm looking back now reflecting on that. Wow, how powerful is that to then be in a company that you end up bootstrapping? Because we did get some investment in the first company, My Daily Thread, I told you about. And with GMC2, we ended up bootstrapping. And I'll, I'll, I'll kind of get, I'll tell you a little bit about that Genesis story because I think it's neat. And it's a neat sort of um, sort of segue out of out of this. So, so yeah, so I did a bunch of online learning, um, digital, I'll call it digital transformation consulting with Queen's Library. Sure. I then was able all sort of by just me meeting people and being sort of out there and excited and passionate, kind of like you and I are here today. And I met and, and, and connected with and ended up consulting with um, Kripalu Center for Health and Yoga, which is one of the foremost yoga retreat centers in the country, helped them with a lot of their online learning, like positive psychology and those kinds of things. And every step of the way, like I had these new ideas. I would like there, I would, I would go for a weekend every three weeks and, you know, for a couple of days of work and then stay there and do a retreat. It was amazing. And I would wake up out of Shavasana, like in yoga, and I would have these ideas and literally draw it on a napkin and I'd bring it to the CEO and talk to him. And he's like, ah, we just want to do like a new, like really expensive website. And it's like, it's okay. They, that wasn't their thing, right? Like doing technology wasn't their thing. So that was their idea of like, what was good. Yeah, no, no, and, and just, I think yeah. anybody who listens or watches this can relate to those moments where you have these brilliant moments of creativity where you go, hey, like oh, I've completely reimagined the possibilities of what you're trying to do. And <laughs> sometimes you get kicked in the teeth. You know, sometimes oh. people are like, yeah, that's nice. No, but no, I, I really wasn't. Well, we got to replace our no thanks. And you're like, units, what? <laughs> it, it can be very deflating. You're like, what? How do you yeah. not see that? And you're like, no, no, at the time. Yeah, it's it's it's, yeah. it's definitely demotivating, but you, which is why it's, you have to kind of be a little bit nutty to be an entrepreneur, right? Because you got to, you know, <laughs> yeah. I think Andreessen, you know, from the famous VC firm once said that entrepreneurs have two emotions. They toggle between elation and terror and that's it. And I can fully attest to that, my friend. <laughs> Um, so I, so I took all those learnings and those ideas. And as you talk about this, man, it, it kind of inspires me to reflect and say, Hey, I really saw the opportunity to connect people with their learning. You would go to Kripalu as an example, and then you'd be so stoked. And then you'd leave and you didn't have a connection to the community, to the content anymore. It just dissipated. It and died. I was like, there's gotta be a better it was way the to event. Continue. You went, you went, that's it. And did it's it. gone. And all this warm fuzzy, there was these moments of creative genius. Yeah. And then it was like, whoop, it died on the vine. And then they wondered why they had some like yearly attrition, yeah. right? Because and I was like, there's gotta be better ways to keep that connectivity with the humans involved with the content, with reflecting and practicing things. And so these seeds started to form, which will come full circle later in the combo, but it was amazing, man. And so I did all that, you know, a bunch of different consulting gigs. And then ultimately um, I, my, so then my wife emails me at the end of like kind of fall of well, coming up on, what is this going to be 10 years? Is that right? Yeah. Um, 2013, we are in 2023. Okay. Yes. And so she's like, I had, I had coached as part of this process, I got involved with coaching and being a part of hackathons. So if people aren't okay. familiar with the hackathon briefly, it's mostly around technology, but it could be around other subjects. You get together okay. over a weekend or three or four days, you form you teams with different crack. and you yeah, build you something, crack you like build like an MVP problems. product. Yes. And you crack yeah. problems. And in this case, it was a, a conference called the feast. Now I had coached hackathons, but I never participated. So she emailed oh, okay. me this thing. I'm like, this looks pretty cool. I'm talking to Andrew. I'm like, yeah, this looks cool. I decided to participate and they had three challenges. One was um, health, one was veterans, one was learning. So I participated in the learning challenge because I had come out of this work with Queen's Library System and Kripalu and some okay. Carnegie Hall, these other really renowned organizations I was working with, which is amazing, phenomenal start to that part of my career. And it really okay. turned me up, man. I was just like super excited about it. And I'm in this room and with the people that were in the learning challenge and we're talking and I hear this guy speak, this guy, Josh. And I'm like, now, mind you, I've been, I chose the pathway of more the architect and vision and sort of the CEO kind of role, which yeah. became to be. Though I, I had always thought, cause I'm sort of a math guy and a music guy and those things combined to maybe being a developer. I think I had the capacity okay. to do that, but I just never, okay. I never de dove deep into that. So I'm looking yeah. for like 10 or 12 years, man, for this dozen years to find my like, like partner as a developer. Other, I had other ideas in the music industry around creating product, and I never could meet the person. And it was always a very big challenge, right? And so I, I no, hear this guy. I know, yeah. I know exactly the feeling you're talking about, where it's like you know you need that second half. Oh my god! And you just don't. I don't want to do it alone. What it is. I'm a right. big. Yeah. I'm a believer in collaboration. Yep. You know, bottom line, I hear this guy speak. I'm like, something just hit me, and I'm very instinctual too, and energetically everything. I'm like, I got to meet this dude. I like, like, you know, went after to speak with him. 
we connected, we, we heard each other. And he, he's, you know, if he was here, he'd say to you later, like, I probably I approached him first, but we heard each other and just love what each other had to say. We formed a team, man. And that weekend we had this amazing designer. We got really lucky and we created this product and we named it, I named it Dream CDU that weekend. And the neat thing is the challenge was around high school, high schoolers and the disconnect around like- Cause that's what I was gonna ask. Like what was the challenge that yeah, you were super interesting. solving? So it was a MacArthur based challenge. I always joke, like I wish they would have been able to provide some kind of money for the winner. Um, but I, <laughs> there's so many intricacies there that my wife explained to me again recently over lunch, I could briefly share, but like it was, it was fine. Um, but they, but they supported this challenge and sponsored it. I'm not sure what sponsorship meant, but it was very cool because they're a renowned organization and I'm not, I'm not like yeah. disparaging them in any way. Love you, MacArthur. They're great. They do great work. But, um, but, but it was just fun, fun memories. And so we built this product and we, the, the challenge was around learning for high schoolers and I internships. Okay. But we took that a step back and said, wait, there's this big disconnect between what's happening in the classroom and what people might do in their career. Yeah. So that goes right back to the earlier part of our conversation This the path of your meandering path and you don't know what you want to do. And we, right. have, we assume it's always that. ABC and it's not, it is not 85% of the time, man. It's not, it's confusing. Yeah. So we're like, there's something here. We can make a synapse fire earlier on. Right. A lot of research has been done at the critical age, like right around middle school into high school, all of these changes are happening. Neuroplasticity is changing. Obviously we know it cements more at 25, but these changes are really taking effect at that age, which I found fascinating. Big part of the learning journey and research we've done over the years. And so we know it's a critical age to reach people that, um, especially in areas where they don't have mentors, they don't have role models. So we really care deeply about that, man. That's another part of this thread is caring deeply about people and, and, and all walks of life, right? And so um, we decided to say, and I'll never forget, we had this deck and the slide was like, a, just like super simple, like a, a, a teacher with like a, you know, just sketched out or an illustrated teacher with like a, you know, kind of a pointer in a classroom, a big equal sign with an X and then like the globe. And that was this first slide. Like there is a disconnect. And I gave this, I was the one who, by the way, I got really sick when we had to present. So we, we won it and uh, we ended up winning the challenge, but we had to present our thing. I did, you know, <laughs> I got super sick and they put me up in the VIP room and I was taking a nap too. They were so cool. The, the people at the feast, <laughs> they became close friends. It was such a cool story. So I'm presenting this thing and, um, and it was just magical, man. And we had this epic party after where they had this group from Canada come in and they had all these speakers that we like these big boom boxes that they'd centralized. I can't remember the name of it. It was incredible. And we're partying throughout the city with the central music system with these yeah. speakers everywhere. It was just an incredible experience. So Josh and I met, I just wanted to give the groundwork of how yeah. magical it was. And, but like we, we took this seed and, um, and it became a thing. And so we created this product. And, and as I was saying earlier, the first product was, and it's the idea of dream CD was you dream what you want to be in high school. Then you got yeah. to see people in your local community that had similar interests to you. So you basically put in your interests into this interest. Picker. You take it from intangible kind of ethereal yes. hundred thousand foot. Then yes. you start to say, Hey, let's see what this looks like again so that you can test and validate Correct. along the way. And we scraped 300,000 LinkedIn profiles when that, not to sell. So we didn't do anything illegal, but like no, before it. they sold to Microsoft. So it was again, a moment in time when you can do that. You could never do that now. They wouldn't let you do that. <laughs> and, but, but a kid could put in their, could put in their interests literally on this little app we created. And I mean, you know, my co-founder's a genius and he's a unicorn, a beautiful person too. And we, we, you know, the design was great and you could literally Pretty magical, oh, like in a hackathon, you could literally put in your interests and you could see a very basic path of people and their journeys. And then we, and then it landed on just like a design because we couldn't do the last part of like, it would land on like a job shadow or an apprenticeship at that okay. company with that person. Intimating what the you full do. cycle. You actually the do. do. The actually, do, man. Okay. And the do, and here's a great, so this is like the sock, which is walking a dream and like the top says dream CD and there's, so we can talk about the socks if you want a little bit, but like, I'll just tease it because we talked about the socks, um, but what we can hold off on that for a second, but the do and dream CD is, is a big one for us, man. Constantly yeah. prototyping, constantly listening and taking it in. from Taking it from head knowledge, from yes. conceptual, that, from what in your head is to, you actually need to experience things. That is our DNA. So the dreaming part is massive. And I used to be big dreaming and vision and didn't know how to put that together in my twenties as much. And I realized like vision's great. Let's zoom back to the present moment, see what's possible and do. And then there's been lots of fun things where Josh and my co-founder's mom always says, so what's interesting doing about this, what's interesting that. about yeah. what you just described with this though, and some of the parallels that I capture as I listen to people share stories and things like this is even that process. Okay. 
of what you just described of helping people go through that process, distinct of maybe what particularly particularly they're focusing on is actually building a critical business skill because helping people go through the process of taking a big idea or something that you, again, have dreamed mm. up or thought, hey, how, and saying, now, what do I do with that? Because honestly, you, I see this in business all the time. One of the biggest disconnects of people going from strategy to execution is people struggle with, oh, I've got this idea, but I really don't know how to carry it forward. So even underneath what you're describing with Dream C Do, you're really actually building a core skill for people around business of being able to say, how do we take you from concept to execution in a meaningful way for what you're trying to accomplish? Yeah, man. And I mean, that's been our whole business. I mean, literally, we've, okay. I mean, you, you just kind of define like our business trajectory, which I can get into a little bit. Absolutely. I mean, at a meta level, what we allow in the product in many ways, um, because listen, I mean, you probably know this because you have so many conversations with folks. It is very, very, very rare. And I'm humbled by it all the time, every day that you take something like this from a hackathon into an actual business that is growing. Yeah. And, you know, and we, and we, based on my prior experiences in my business, we decided to bootstrap this thing. So, so just finishing that story, I'll explain. So Josh and I had this concept and we created this product and we won these, this, this, this hackathon. And, and I went two months later to visit him in SF. There was some, something there. The rest of the team kind of folded back. Like we wanted to keep our designer. She just wasn't an entrepreneur, which is totally cool. And, and yeah. it was a big moment where she was like very upset and she wanted to do it, but she couldn't. It was cool. But we so we took those designs and we just, and we kind of weaned those and used those for a couple of years. And we were selling things in education. So we sort of, I went to Josh in, in SF. We talked about it. Within four months, man, he moved to New York to be with me to do this thing. So it was the dream. I mean, You're we all really, in. We were all in right away. We just knew there was some magic there. And and we've it's, it's been a very up and down, but, you know, journey since then. But it started there and he moved to New York. And then, of course, my wife and I decided to leave like six weeks or two months later to have our first kid. So, so he followed us a little bit to Connecticut. We're going back and forth between Connecticut and New York. And it was an incredible journey. He was there in New York for two years um, with me. And, um, and, and that's how it started. So it's very rare. And we stayed committed to it um, because we started putting together clubs um, in schools, in, in like in communities that you know, with kids that really did not have all of the okay. So in the early days, you yeah. really were primarily we were. working with first year like and a half the youth. Yes, okay. and we were doing clubs in Newark and uh, in um, in Brooklyn and in um, in uh, Oakland, and we to prototype. So really in person, man. So this has been okay. a thread, and I look back and I even even recently, it's of like deep connection and deeply prototyping in a human centered way with the people we want to work with to truly understand their needs. And I, I think that's a theme that I, 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 I'd like to share and unpack a bit. It's just, there's a different way to create a technology company where you can deeply connect with people and then use those learnings to figure out if you're a SaaS company, for instance, how do you then scale that in a way you want to scale, you know? And yeah. you don't have to yeah, just try to throw money at it right technology, away. There's yeah. sometimes this idea that technology is in competition with that. And I personally live at the intersection of going, no, no, it doesn't. It's no. a false... It's a false, it's a paradox. It seems like it, it seems like you'd have to choose, but you actually don't if you're doing it well. Yeah, and, and my belief is like, if you just focus on volume at first, you miss, at first you miss the boat of, of being able to, it's hard of being able to really a, retain your values and stick to your guns about creating something innovative and really working yeah. through the process. You're really working through it and doing it and learning and growing and trying. We had 13 different industries, man, when we, because we are, we are, our biggest strengths are like creating innovative, interesting products using that human centered approach and the relationships we form. So because of that, we had a lot of interest in our original products. We were selling things within a year. But like the, we we quickly realized that the education industry for directly to, to youth, um, we were probably the first product to do this kind of synapse between like what happens in high school and what you want to do in your career. I've seen dozens of really cool products since then. We chose to back off from D1 okay. in 2015, early 2015 to move to adult learning, um, okay. mainly because it just wasn't. It was a saturated market. It was very hard for us. And we, our other use case, even at the hackathon that we won, was around adult learning. We just kind of had put it on the back burner. Okay. But we saw a big need in adult learning. At the time, it was... Um, I, it's significant. Yeah. I mean, it's what you're talking about in terms of the... gap. And it, what's interesting is my background was in elementary education. I taught middle school for That's a so period. Neat. And there is this idea sometimes that, oh, adults are so much different than kids. And really 
they're not. There's so many parallels between the two. We're yeah. <laughs> and so the learnings from that, but again, the opportunity that you're describing, I mean, the number of conversations I'm in with business and HR leaders where this is a huge gap for employees. And it's, it's a business problem now because companies are going, how do we help people bridge this gap? Because they're leaving yep. or they're not moving forward to meet the needs of the business or it, it's an engagement problem. It's a retention problem. It's a business innovation problem. And the assumption that, Oh, well, you're a grown up. You know how to do this. <laughs> Especially with leadership it's and wrong. management, man. I mean, like, yeah. like, you know, like with leaders and managers, like you're not meant to be that. I mean, you may have the propensity and some of the skill sets, but you, that requires coaching that requires peer yes. uh, learning and mentorship and things that, I have naturally gravitated towards, but not everybody does that. And, and, and so that part of the, the, the cycle is, but in any, any career, right? And so, and I, I think the other thing I'll add, man, is like, listen, by starting in high school, we had this interesting uh, sort of self-selected forcing agent to say, we want to focus on like a very lightweight and beautiful design because these kids are not going to do anything else. Like they're used to beautifully designed consumer products. Oh yeah. Consumer grade. They're used right. to consumer we, grade exactly. stuff. They're not we used cannot, to corporate apps. No, we can't. So that actually created it, this focal point, which I've always cared about too. And so it's Josh, we're very focused on creative, a very lightweight, beautiful design, man, which has been a thread of our product all along in the DNA. Okay. So I credit a well, lot of that with, interesting, the, with the original like, or Going back yeah. to what we were saying though, and I think this is one of the dangers for folks listening that I see in organizations all the time is it's easy to assume that, well, people are adults, so they know and then fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. they, they already know this. They're already aware. And time and time again, throughout my career, there's a lot of things that even if people conceptually in their head have the head knowledge, the practice, one, they lack the practice to actually have done it before. And they, or they may just not be comfortable with it, which comes through experience. And a lot of times companies make these false assumptions about what people can do or what they already know that actually is really holding them back. So you leaning into that, I think is an important factor because it is a big market opportunity that often gets overlooked. Yeah. And we define this early days as like experiential learning, you know, dreams he do on um, the doing okay. part being really important. We created like nomenclature early days, 2016, 17, like uh, calling it like online learning communities, man, stuff that people did not understand. Things have obviously gone through a massive paradigm shift since, since the pandemic hit, but our language was too mature, I think, at the time, and we, we needed to learn how to match. You and I talked about this yeah. in the, sort of in the green room. Yeah, I was like, going to say some of the yeah. words you're using at that time frame. People and it didn't, didn't have people didn't get it, so we had to like, like we had to like reduce community. Yeah, like, what's a community? Dude? Yeah, it was comes down like, to the lowest common denominator of like this is yeah. an LMS or this now is an LXP, which I told you is like we're defining it more as like a talent or people development platform now as we've matured, which I don't think is really out there as much in the common nomenclature. It's more like an LMS or an LXP, but we're not trying to be like a corporation's cornerstone, right? Like we we talked about that earlier yeah. too, which we can, we can tease out a little bit more later. But yeah, man, it was experiential learning. And our three pillars early on, I think I was alluding to this earlier, were always connection, practice, and reflection. And it was for, sure. for eight years, man. And it was like two years ago. And I'm like a writer. I've written blogs. I've, you know, I've been an editor. I've done all these creative things. I'm sitting there, I think, writing a blog a couple of years ago. And I'm like, oh my God, this is CPR. Like imagine that marketing moment, like CPR for your training and coaching. I'm like, why did it take me seven effing years or eight years to figure this out? And I go to my team and I'm like, what I know. like about that though, is you didn't reverse engineer it. Cause I do see that happen a lot of no, times. It was people sitting there make up an face. acronym and then they're like, okay, what words can we fit into this? And you no go, way. It was sitting uh, in my face. No. So I think, I think it's beautiful that it, it took you me eight years. opposite. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, to that you put that. it together and, and then you, that, you like lined it up and went, hey, wait a minute, that makes a really, really And then really we're creating videos and really ebooks about research. Yeah, exactly. Now, DSD yeah. has come out of Dream CDU because the name Dream CDU, people, it's funny, juxtaposition, people have always loved the name because they kind of get it. But then people have said like Dream CDU, like the CDU, like the watercraft or like all these funny <laughs> things, bro. It's hilarious. And so we kept the name. We've thought about changing it, but every time we do, we ask our audience, we ask our and they're like, no, don't change it. So DSD came out of an acronym because it's easier to pronounce. So that's another story. which naturally came out. So there's people that call it DSD. But no, the CPR thing that was incredible. And I say that because it's really around this experiential thing, really around this engaging together and creating an engaging environment. Because when we started Gene Studio, when we did our market research, Christopher, we saw these platforms. And listen, when Blackboard came out in 97, 
brilliant. Watershed, man, it's like they changed the sure. game. Like it never happened before. But unfortunately, most platforms have not really advented a lot beyond no, that. No, many have then. not. And it's and, and it's unfortunate not. because of the way that the, the, the system is set up to be focused more on like bigger sales and things of that nature. I don't think we get into all that, the reasons why, but we really focus on, we want to truly understand what's needed. And we fundamentally believed, and we did all the research to prove it's because it's all around flat and passive content dissemination. And that has yes. not very much changed. And that's not no, it has, from an engaging... industry standpoint. Yeah, no, yeah. From, a, from an industry standpoint, that is, I actually had a panel right before this where I talked about the fact that as an industry, we have largely over-indexed on this for a long time and that has not changed. And so while we iterate and we, you know, innovate on the content experience, it largely still sits in two dimensions. Yep. And as a result, a lot of the technologies that end up supporting it, they're focused on that because it's like, well, that's if that's what people are doing, then that's what we're going to support, right. which next... creates a really poor user experience. And it's actually not good learning because yeah. that's not really how you learn. You don't learn through flat 2D experiences where you go, well, there, I, I watched or experienced a thing. Now yeah. I know how to do it. Is it a part of the process? Sure, but it's not the end game. No, and, we, and it goes back to your other point about we just expect people like, oh, here's a the thing. They're adults. They, they should know it or learn it. Well, if you can't right. in this, in this world where things are so digitally oriented and, you know, and you're not sure if you're going to be in person or not, you know, when the pandemic happened and those kinds of things, you need to create a blended experience that can be cohort based where you really involve peers if possible. It doesn't have to be a peer, peer based, but that's very powerful. And so those, those pillars of being able to connect in multiple ways with a facilitator, with a coach, with peers, with your leaders or managers, being able to practice something and reflect. We've done all the research. I found this beautiful writing partner who's become part of our team, a PhD, who wrote about social capital, man, which is so cool. It's the idea of like collaboration to create to create knowledge. So like in and like that there's this arc, like this 25, 30 year arc of like within within like commerce and industries that's kind of starting to articulate where we're sort of reaching that with our platform. And he saw GMC Newton, he's like, oh my God, you're like, you literally are the platform that's sort of embodying my research. And so we're writing all these white papers now around all of the research around connection, practice, and reflection that create our own learning model, which we call the CPR learning flywheel that we've sort of we've trademarked. And that that creates a DNA and an environment where people are really engaged. And we're constantly, that's the DNA of our platform. We're constantly creating features where you can reflect asynchronously, but people can comment on that. Um, you can engage um, in, in a learning arc online, like in a live, a live group coaching call or one-on-one -on -one coaching calls. That could be in-person or online, and it's all codified in GMC2, but it's a very different approach from the ground up, right? So we are, we, everything we, we yeah. create, want it to be elegant and, and beautiful and easy to use. But it's, I think, again, to your point, like juxtaposed to the industry standard, which is very flat, when folks see the platform, you know, they're like, oh my God, like, where have you guys been? But we're this little guy that's sort of like finally like growing to a point where we're making some noise, I think. And but it's, it's been a journey, yeah. man. It's been hard. You know, we, we chose that path so we could create something different. And, and well, we, yeah. And I was going to say, what's interesting about this, and I'm curious your take as you've gone into this, because, um, you know, if you look at a lot of the research out there, you'll see a lot of times, it's not that people don't have a desire to grow. They feel pressed for time or they say, and to me, this is always like, it's an indicator. They're pressed for time. And to me, I always look at that and go, no, when people are pressed for time, it means they see the other things they're doing is more important than whatever it is you're presenting. And when we talk about this 2d flat experience, I'm never surprised that people often don't prioritize it over some of these other things. Because in my experience, when, when I've been involved in building or delivering or deploying the rich experiences you're talking about, you still have to overcome some of the barriers. But once people start to understand that that is really what they're getting out of this, it's amazing how people will find time to engage with these. They will make time for some of these things because Agreed. they realize the richness of the experience and the things that before they're like, oh, I'm too busy to do that. You have, but because of how the industry has been, we often have to overcome that because people automatically assume, oh yeah, this is going to be a different kind of experience. I've heard that before. And then I've gone and experienced the same thing I've always done. And I think I'm curious as you see that it's, it's a shift for organizations to have to change their way of thinking and their way yeah. of operating to deliver what you're describing. 
because agreed. It's and we've typically not how things work. Yeah, we've experienced that. And what I would say is, it's interesting because it's like sort of the one of the purposes of the of the conversation. Um, you know today was about like, what is the purpose of a modern learning platform? And that's really what we're, our exploration is about and, and what we're creating, Christopher. And, and I think for us, it's creating that engagement because those experiences that are 2D are demotivating. And it's, a, it's no surprise why like stats of like, you know, seven to 15% completion rates across all LMSs and only 25% of like leadership training as a whole is retained and is aligned to, you know, strategic initiatives at corporations because they're experiencing a lot of these 2D experiences. That, well, and then stack on top of it, stack on top of it, when you talk about what you did with Dream C Do and kind of the mindset and philosophy behind it, even if you can create an extraordinary experience, sometimes that connection and relevance is not there for people because you haven't walked them through the journey of, what is that vision you're casting? Yes. How does this then connect? Then now how does this experience connect to it? So you may create, and that's where I've seen people create really, really solid experiences, but then be frustrated when they go, well, but people aren't really like engaging with it. And it's like, well, that's because you didn't do that work to help them connect the vision of what they're trying to achieve, the vision of where they're trying to go and going that plus this, plus this gets you there. You get that equation, right? People will, people will engage and make it a priority, but it's not an easy task. No, it's messy. You're, you're entirely right. And that's it exactly is very what, messy. That's what we're doing right now. We know that. And we're not trying to do the short circuit answer, man. We're literally, we, we've created a new product called Bonsai, which is fun. I kind of named it the other summer, um, uh, not this past summer, this summer, but the summer before we've been working for a year on a new product because our clients have been providers like thought leading Goldman, you know, um, various organizations that are thought leading providers of talent development um, and, and thought leaders in their own sort of fields of discipline for like 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Right. Okay. And so for them, it's been challenging. They know they want to scale their work. And some folks yeah. like, like Goldman, as I mentioned, they've done really well in GMCD and they're a newer client to us, a client partner, we say. And we, again, it's that customer intimacy. We call them client partners. It's like, it's even in our language, right? We care about that. Yeah. But we, but it's it's challenging to move from a when you're in person delivering stand and deliver to a blended environment. So what we've articulated towards is how do we create cycles of where we we help them with the design, the blended design, and we now even we have we have um, competency and expertise in house to help folks understand how to coach or manage in a hybrid environment, man, which is huge. Okay. So usually it's a transactional thing. It's a SaaS platform. You have someone just out of college trying to explain. Yeah, that's, that's your question. Which, so which like, is a big gap because you can, you right. will get organizations that will get these tools that, and, and I know a lot of them out there that some of these tools, they are well-designed. They have the best intentions. They don't really use it. But the people they are sold to do not understand how to, work it. Yes. And the and company's selling it. People going. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like what? Yeah. You're going to say these people going kind of like, what do I do with this? I always said like, well, you yeah, can't just, and it's like, yeah. I have this idea, but I don't know how to do it. Going back to even the whole philosophy of dream C do I have this vision, but like, I've never seen it in practice. I've never done it before. Perfect and maybe simple. now I have the vehicle to do it, but I don't even know where to start. And that's where you run into these where you'll see people go, wow, I, I tried and it didn't work. And it's like, well, I think there probably were some gaps along the way that would have helped you close that gap. Yes. And, the, and it's funny because you, you mentioned that. And I, I, it's, it's, it's another reason why we kept the name because there's just so these meta analogies of dream C do that kind of come up thematically and like the work it sort of is emblematic, which is super neat um, just as a side note, but you're right, man. I mean, like companies just sort of like they're, they're volume oriented typically in SaaS. So, I mean, in a nutshell, I mean, there's a bigger conversation there, but so there, there isn't that we put our best people, we created a, we created a role called lead product advisor who sticks with you from demo all the way through your experience onboarding and beyond to support you in customer success. All those roles at most SaaS companies, as you know, are broken up into different roles. So you're passed from person to person to person. Okay. And we went back to the old school, man. And it's like, no, you have that one person that you always have with you. And we believe that's meaningful. It supports so they, you through your experience. They're educating you. Yeah, but they're, and they're there to educate you and nurture you, their relationship and support you. What we've gotten better at is kind of shortening those cycles to help people get up to speed quicker, making sure that yeah. it's scalable enough for us because, but we did a lot Versus of Versus offering the one tactical, like you get two hours of webinars where we run you through yeah. how the system works. No, you've got a real person and it's our best person people. 
It's our best people, our best product knowledge people that are going to walk you through how to design this thing, give you feedback. We can add on deeper design if you want as part of a service offering to make sure it's sticky for us, but also make sure that you actually are successful. Now, ultimately, Christopher, it's up to the organization. What we have learned recently is that no matter how much we put into that, we cannot no. control who's going to be successful and who's going to care. It's more about how they operationalize that. So we're in a moment where we're like opening things up and we've figured out a way. But I think that's the that. challenge of any learning professional in general is you can only take people so far. So what you're experiencing on Correct. the SaaS end is the truth of talent development. You can only, as in talent development organization, take people so far. You can create the infrastructure, you can create the resources, you can create the opportunity, but at some point they have to either do it or not do it. And I think the same is true with some of these really transformative SaaS products that really are doing powerful and innovative things. Like ultimately, and I think this is my message back to practitioners and you know internal folks is the technology cannot save you no. from the lackluster stuff that is often attributed to corporate learning. It cannot save you. The best platform in the world cannot save you from that. Can it be an enabler? Can it be an accelerant? And are there companies like what you're describing that are doing a phenomenal job of doing everything they can to make you successful? Yes. But ultimately, you have responsibility in that. And shirk that, yeah. you're doomed. Yeah, man. And there are a handful of companies out there that are trying in different ways than us, which I really value you know, in the ecosystem, but not a lot, man, And as you know. And what I would say to that is like, you know, um, so, so we really chose the pathway of deepening our relationships, as you can imagine, based on the conversation with our client partners, with the learners yeah. to learn with them over the years, to create this experience, to kind of come full circle now where we're actually, we figured out a way. So we were a higher price option with a much higher quality, more engaging experience. Like, and we named that we were in the market. And so now we figured out a way to be able to say, like, take that and vastly reduce the cost and now offer that to individual coaches again in smaller organizations that are providers okay. so we can build this this cadre of very high quality facilitated blended experiences on dream studio and these various providers the next phase for us and the bigger opportunity is to then connect them with organizations on the corporate side to so they have an opportunity that's different than the flat learning of like a linkedin learning or udemy you know that that is more like around kind of video content and, and so on and so forth no which is actually yeah. it's it's phenomenal you're helping bridge that gap as well because i even see this a lot on the practitioner side where they have lacked exposure to what good can look like yeah and so that's where you see a lot of perpetuating the same things on repeat is many people when you go well okay can you show me an example or can you give me an example of what an extraordinary experience is sometimes it's very difficult to find them and so instead people go oh oh well that's what it is and it's like well no but then then people iterate and innovate around what they think good looks like that actually isn't good so I think you actually offering that helps. Yeah. And it forces them to cobble things together. Like, well, I want video from here and I want like, you know, resource bank of, of, of resources here. And I want to be able to kind of do group coaching or live coaching or events. And it's all in seven different platforms, man. And it's like, a, that's what we see. Our clients come to us with seven. Oh, I know. It's to no, cobble together. I, I, and you're like, how can that be easy to manage or feel good as a learner? It's like, I don't No, I'm can't. telling you, having worked with big corporate organizations, any one of the big dogs or even some of the medium small dogs who have started to build out their ecosystem. This really is the challenge that many practitioners find themselves in where they're MacGyvering. Yeah, they're okay. attempting to MacGyver a meaningful experience. Dude, and it's yeah. like, well, um, you've got this and you got to go over here. I got this paper clip and this rubber band. And if I super glue it, maybe it'll work and you can't manage it well. And the end user experience is catastrophic. Yeah, man. And so that's been, um, that's been our main focus, Christopher, like the, the whole time is creating that really, really engaging experience that has those tools in a beautifully designed way. And now we have all these providers that we're building, you know, continue to build out that are on there. And that the, the goal is to say, hey, not only can we provide you this platform for this superior people development experience, cor purpose driven corporation or whatever it might be, because that's where you, yep. we want to start with folks that are ready or that are not at status quo and eventually show use cases and, and case studies that worked really well to then get sort of the larger organizations on board that, that aren't quite ready, which, which is totally fine. And we get it. And we think that's a good process and a good kind of go to market. Well, on, and I on think what's going to be interesting, what's going to be interesting about this based on what you described and even just listening to some of 
where you were based on the different timing of things. It's you've been ahead of where I think the industry often is, which is a challenging place to be. And I know a lot of founders who have been ahead of the curve. And sometimes that's some of the hardest places because you're even just trying to get people to understand (laughs) what it is you're doing. And they're like, what? But what I think is going to be interesting and not to make this an AI conversation, but I think largely some of the disruption we've seen coming on the heels of 2022 and 2023 is creating more opportunity and capacity for practitioners to start thinking differently and go, you know what? We don't just have to be a content shop anymore. We don't just have to be delivering these 2D experiences. And what if, what would we do if we could do anything? And I, again, just talked about this before we connected today uh, on a panel about the fact that AI is opening opportunity and capacity for people to ask those questions and to truly innovate and go, you know what? Maybe the way we've always done it, maybe instead of just looking at making iterative jumps in what we're doing, maybe we really should go back to the drawing board and say, what does an extraordinary experience look like? Yeah, I I don't know a single learning practitioner that doesn't cognitively know that watching a YouTube video by itself Myself, will yeah. transform a person's behavior. No. And we, we all know this. Nobody's going like, well, I disagree. I think but that it's still so prevalent. We all I know. Know. Yet it's so prevalent, but I think there's some real opportunity right now for us to go, Hey, not only do we know this, but now there's technology that's supporting it. And we are going to be in the coming years having more capacity to do some of this. Yeah. Man. And that's what this bonsai experience is about. You know, we, we came up with this because like the, the, the idea was like, you know, bonsai is the art of growing and training plants in small pots. And so I love that metaphor of like, we're working on humans developing and like, you know, all yeah. the different ways you can think about that. And it's funny, man, we try to look for a URL. We couldn't find anything with the right spelling. So we, we use one of these techniques where we took it, the estimated the Z and called it go bonsai, which is fun. But, but really, man, it's, as you talk about that, that's really what we've done too, is we took our like seven years of learning and we really started to mature in like 2019, right? Like a year before the pandemic. Um, but we did a lot of prototyping, as you know, even in the adult space from 2015 to 2019, before we, we really made this a, a true mature company on our own, you know, you know work and, and sweat, blood, sweat, and tears is like looking at all that we created our, we, we spent the last eight months creating our, des- our bonsai design principles and creating like literature and a new site around like what this experience is. And you said this earlier, Christopher, and this is key. You can't just drop technology on people. I don't care if we think ours is better and our clients do. We know that. And we're going to come into our corporate engagements and frame it and say, this is why a bonsai experience is different. Here's the proof of the pudding from seven years of work on our platform and all the great MPS scores and the great engagement scores that are blowing things out of the roof, which is great, but it's beyond that. It's the human connection that we can support you in your goals, bring in our providers with the, you know, beautifully married and dovetail to the features. And also we can, we can create, our team can create your own bespoke things as well. So that full ecosystem that you want can be done, but at a, at a, at a reasonable price, whereas like individual coaches and training companies that you're finding and trying to find as an LMD, it's expensive and chaotic, man. Like how did, and so we're consolidating all of that for people into one beautiful experience that by the way, we can easily with our API connect into cornerstone for deep linking and SSO and all those things. And no one else is doing this because I don't know if they're willing to do the harder. I, I don't I don't know. I just don't know. All I can say is we're willing to do the harder work to support that in our way of a scalable way where we can have that customer intimacy, where we can spend those cycles because you work so hard on learning what it's like to have those cycles of, of deep connection and support where we can tighten those and we can still have more clients and support them to do yeah. that. And that's what your is about. So it's really, it's an experience right now. Then just to add to that point, to your AI point, we are adding on AI features around like, you know, giving coaches or practitioners or managers like if someone does a reflection on GMC due to a prompt, like let's say there's a prompt, like how do you practice empathy? And then asynchronously you go off, um, Christopher, and you do a video reflection or a journal entry on GMC do that goes automatically to your coach or facilitator or manager. And they can see that um, anytime. And now they can make a comment. So there's like this activation that happens even asynchronously. Okay. You've got a yeah. f- feedback loop. Yes. But now we add AI to that and it gives you suggest, it takes the question and the response, it feeds it in and it gives you automated ideas 
but we we still want it to be really really um uh human centered and very human centered yep so so you still have to edit it but you have an idea starter we don't want to totally only use ai because we feel like having a human there and i think we, what you yeah. just described right there is a perfect example of how to use ai well because i think this is one of those things where sometimes the pressure and the tendency to AI, AI can automate and we can streamline this and we can move things so much faster and faster isn't always necessarily better. And I think that's one of the things that the ability to spark that creativity, spark that, that is a fantastic use of it because oftentimes, and this is where AI plays a great job. It can look yeah. at these things and faster than often people can come up with because it's pulling from a large language model and capturing all of human capacity in one thing. You go, ah, based on that, what about these things? But then it's that mix of having the human look at that and go, I know the context. I know the situation. Yeah, I know where I'm at. Way. And now I'm going to evolve it to really meet the nuance of what I'm trying to accomplish. But you're really shortening that gap while preserving the human experience. And I think this goes back to what we've talked about through this whole thing is that technology does not have to be in competition no, with the no. human experience if you're doing it right. If anything, it can absolutely enhance and unlock the possibilities of what an incredible human experience can look like. Yeah, it's a dynamic synergy, but you have to approach it, it differently. Is. And that's what that's what I want to do for younger entrepreneurs is to, to, to also talk about in, you know, in, in, in forums like this. There's a different way of doing things. You have to commit in a different yes. way. You have to be willing to take on different sacrifices and challenges, but the outcomes can be really profound. And the way that you'll feel when you have the fulfillment is beautiful. And so like, if I answer the question, what is the purpose of a modern learning platform? It's really taking the time necessary to think about what is actually needed and to listen. And so what we're trying to do right now with, with corporations is we're not just jumping head first into the corporate. We've spent a year on customer development and longer, we're gonna to continue to do this until we're ready, as we've always done, to really understand the discrete pain points and needs of either a leader or an L&D person or HR person at a corporation right now and with their, particularly for us managers and leaders, because that's a big focus for us around soft yep. skills because our tools are designed yeah. for that, but what do they really need? And why? And how is that not being served? And, and for the future of work, because there's remote leadership, there is, you know, uh, continuous learning cycles for young managers. There's all these AI and L&D like we just talked about. How do you do these things? And that's where our level of expertise is as a company that we can infuse into the process with the backing of all of our providers as well. And I think the purpose of any company out there trying to focus on a modern learning platform is move it out of 2D. Like whatever you do, like make it yeah. interesting. Think, find a thing that yeah. maybe combines AI because it's powerful, but don't do it just because it's trendy. Really no. Uh -uh. Prototype, go into yeah. it. Yeah. Be thoughtful, hold hands with people and learn together. It might take a little bit longer, but the outcome will finally be different, you know? And then, yep. you know, and it's, it creates a different- well, yeah, And I think yeah. that's, that's such a great component as we come into the home stretch on this to think about as you look at this, because for anybody watching and listening who's made it this far, I think there's always this like, so what do I do with it? And I think to your point, there's some of these, like, there's not a universal answer because everybody's in a different state yet. There are some universal principles behind that. And one of them is what you just described right there is look at what you can do to take it from 2d to 3d. If you're going there, might it look different? Might what you do with it look different than some? Absolutely. And you're going to have to acknowledge the complexity and the nuance of your organization. Yep. But so long as you're saying we're we are committed to going from 2D to 3D, and what does that look like for us? And yeah. where can we lean into that? And how are we using the technology to further enrich the human experience versus dehumanize it? And to me, that's the biggest litmus test of technology is, is it enriching human experience or is it dehumanizing and, and do it, if, if you go for it you know i was just saying and do it with love because one of yeah. the first things we said early days was like all of these platforms out there lms's or what have they're ripping the humanity out of the experience so i, yes. I exactly and like do it with love and bring that heart to it um we didn't get to talk we got a next chat man we'll have to talk entirely about socks 
<laughs> right? We did say. We did I know, say we're going to tell. Yeah, I know. I Our socks say walking the dream on the bottom, but that, that'll be the teaser But for next time. But yeah, there it's, there's something there around go. socks and companies doing things that are different, but this has been such a fun I time. Know, I know. It blew by. All right. Well, so yeah. much fun. Well, Jeremy, this has been an absolute pleasure. I told you we'd just be getting warmed up before we got to the conclusion here. So thank you so much. Too, um, for those who are listening, yeah. this is a really important discussion about how we need to make this shift from 2D to 3D. And we actually have the opportunity and the capacity to do it now and the technology is there to support it. Yeah. So Jeremy, I, I love your story and I love this conversation. So thank you for making the time and joining of me course. today. Yeah, I had a great time. And thanks so much for having me. And yeah, I look forward to seeing you again. It's great. All right. Well, thanks everybody. I hope you have a wonderful thanks, rest Joe. of your week and we will be back next week.